thank you very much for, for being here. Um, this is a, a work in progress. I just started working on, on, on this project on, on water, so here it goes. In my current project, I study how the conflict over the meaning of water in the Andes during the colonial times is inseparable from the struggle between different modes of exchange and envir environment-making regimes. In his structure of world history, Coyen Caratani provides a history of four modes of exchange, which he labels A, B, C, and D, which coexist in all social formations and differ only in regard to which mode is dominant. Mode of exchange A is a structure around the principle of reciprocity, in which a giving of gifts imposes the obligation of counter gifts. Mode of exchange B arises when one community plunders another. If mode of exchange A is a dialectics of gift and counter gift, the mode of exchange B is a dialectics of plunder and redistribution. The best example of this mode of exchange is the state, which is interpreted not as a mere superstructure of capitalist economy, but rooted in, in exchange between protection and obedience, service, or tribute. It is a mode of exchange in which subjects are granted peace and protection in exchange for goods, money, and obedience. Mode of exchange C is money commodity exchange. Karateni reads the general formula of capital in the first volume of Marx Capital in terms of mercant capital, that is MCM cycle, in which the goal is to produce surplus value. And finally, mode of exchange D appears in universal religions and it's basically a pure and unreciprocated gift, and Karatani associates this with anarchism, communism, he says anarchism, communism, associationism, or X, since the name is not important, and uh, it will be interested to think it in terms of this generosity principle as pure and reciprocated gift, where there is a radical coincidence between freedom and uh, equality. But from an environmental perspective, what is still missing in Karatani's system is a systematic treatment of mode of exchange E, human, non-human metabolic exchange. My approach retains Karatani's emphasis on, mo on forms of exchange between humans, but it also pays attention to Jason Moore's notion of social formations as being inherently environment-making. Taking this theoretical literature seriously has led me to pursue a perspectivist mode of textual analysis, one that focuses on the sphere of ideology as it oscillates between ecological and economic symbolic perspectives. Since I am not an anthropologist or a historian, but a literary critic engaged in colonial intellectual history, I devote my project to the study of what Son Rithel calls real abstraction, namely abstractions that take place first in the sphere of exchange, and then ideology transfers them to the sphere of nature. What we could call an eco-perspectival approach brings a work, what an eco-perspectival approach would bring to the World Ecology Project is an examination of hydropower as nature cultural assemblages that articulate contingent relations of conflict and cooperation between different modes of exchange. With this purpose in mind, I will talk about the different layers of meaning in El Inca Arcilaso de la Vega, 1539-1616, who was a mestizo chronicler and the author of the famous Comentario Reales de los Incas and the Florida del Inca. The, the commentaries are a neoplatonic defense of the civilizing role of the Incas, who, according to the author, possessed a rational knowledge of natural law and the existence of God. His writings, which are considered of great literary value, con continue to draw interest of scholars from different disciplines and have become a battleground between European perspectives and Amerindian cultures. Garcilla Society, the French philosopher Jean Baudin, author of The Method of History, 1566, who divided the past into three stages. The first one this was the primitive chaotic anarchy and savagery. The second one was the mosaic dispensation of Old Testament. And the third one, the current age of the kingdom of Christ. Garcilaso backed up his narrative from primitive anarchy to Christian civilization with a neoplatonic, with a neoplatonic philosophy of Leon Hebreo, whose translation was Garcilaso's first published work, La Traducción del Indio de los Tres Diálogos de Amor de Leon, de Leon Hebreo, 1589. This work is a synthesis of Plato and Aristotle with Moses and Maimonides, where inferior, chaotic, decomposed elements strive for the unit of God in a universe animated by descending rays of divine intelligence. 
In this hierarchical ontology, all men participate in the unit of the world. As Alinka liked to say, the world is one. Before the separation between chaos and heaven, the infra-world was a chaotic, amorphous abyss, confused and decomposed, inhabited only by dark waters, aguas tenebrosas, or hidden waters, aguas ocultas. These inferior waters are diametrically opposed to superior waters, aguas superiores, produced by the imposition of ideal immaterial forms on inferior waters. The text proceeds in a neoplatonic way, opposing inferior, chaotic, murky waters to superior, ordered waters from above. And the divinity divines, divides the world into three worlds, intellectual, celestial, and corruptible, by infusing ideal forms over inferior waters, transforming them into superior waters. This dualism divides water between water from above and water from below, superior and inferior water, chaotic and ordered water, and yet this division does not completely, completely exhaust uh, Garcilaso's views on the archaic, this archaic element because his neoplatonic choices are definitely marked by Andean beliefs. For instance, this division between water from below and water from above has its Andean correlate in a hydrological cycle described by one of the world's leading experts in Inca, in, on the Inca Arcilaso called Jose Antonio Masotti. A read of representations of two-headed beings were certainly not rare in Andean traditions. There are numerous examples of, of Amaru, the two-headed serpent. This immensely popular figure represents the forces of the underworld as they emerge established ties with the Kaipacha or world, world of the Earth's surface. The sense of movement implied in this double image helps to explain why this mythical being was seen to embody circular flaws of the universe, for such movements seem consonant with the Hanak Pacha Mayo or the celestial river, the Milky Way, whose constellations controlled agricultural cycles and gave movements to, to gener generative rivers of the earth. The image is a sign of the circular virtues of renovation which make it possible to move from one state to another and thereby bring about symbolic and cosmogonic configurations. This paper explores the centrality of the writings of Elinka Garcilaso in the influential social model for understanding ecological and economic relations created by John Mura, known as the Vertical Ecological Archipelago, which consists of two interrelated propositions. According to the first part of the thesis, the, an extensive vertical network of connected multiple ecological zones forming an archipelago that allowed Andean peoples to take advantage of ecological diversity of zones to satisfy their needs. According to the second part of the thesis, Andeans organized these vertical zones according to a reciprocal mode of exchange. The combination of vertical Andean landscape with reciprocal modes of exchange resulted in what Mura called Lo Andino, the Andean way, a specifically Andean mode of organization irreducible to European patterns, according to Mura. Although Mora's conceptualization has been accused of being transhistorical and considered Andean culture as problematically mutable and impermeable to change, I interpret this model following an approach that sees it as a form of a state hydro hydropower, that is, a, a mode of environment making that used irrigation systems to control both people and the biosphere while still retaining features of a former reciprocal mode of exchange. This form of hydropower has certain affinities be, uh, with Christian Parenti's notion of a state geopower and with, with, with Fogel's hydraulic state. To accomplish this task, I propose an eco perspectivist reading of Elinka Arcilaso de la Vega's description of how the Incas won the consent and goodwill of their subjects by fostering public works and mimicking the previous reciprocal modes of exchange practiced by their own conquered people. He shows how this exchange involved the construction of andenes, canals, and acequias, irrigation ditches, as part of their tributary obligations, producing a loop in which the Incas appeared as generous masters who gave their irrigation techniques to more primitive Indians. While Garcilas also depicts the rotational system of distribution of water in which indigenous people took turns in sharing water as an Inca feature, he attributes this practice to Inca, the Inca generosity, therefore subsuming the reciprocal mode of exchange in a tributary mode of exchange. 
an eco, an eco perspectivist reading of Garcilaso can help us reevaluate Mora's vertical archipelago as a form of a state hydropower that still has traces of, of a reciprocal mode of exchange, an idea that will become crucial for contemporary environmental justice movements. By making an eco perspectivist reading of Andean concepts of water and water management, in one of the central sources of Mura's model, the writings of Inca Garcilaso, I detect the presence of a paradoxical oscillation between the notion of water as an instrument of imperial domination and water as a sacred and unconditional gift. I argue, sorry, I argue that a fundamental component of this paradoxical split is the tension between pre-Inca ideals of reciprocal of reciprocity practiced by Andean communities and the transformation of these practices into a system of, dis of redistribution deployed by the Inca state. In sum, it is possible to interpret Garcilaso's hydropower as a form of political dominion in which Incas benefited their own, their own subjects by resolving the problems posed by nature with irrigation techniques. Garcilaso shows how ir irrigation works simultaneously as a technology for dominating nature and a technology for dominating people, joining hydropower in one single apparatus. Murat tried to differentiate this twofold thesis from the, in, from the idea of the Inca state as a welfare state. According to Mura, this has its origins in the writings of El Inca Arcilaso, who created the impression that the singular trait of the Incas was the use of accumulated reserves to compensate for scarcity and inclement weather. The vision of this generous Inca state led to the fable of the socialist empire of the, Inca, of the Incas, popularized by Louis Baudin. Mora characterizes the anachronistic, this anachronistic misunderstanding of the Inca as welfare state by tracing his idea back to the reception of Garcilaso's conceptualization of the pre-Inca and Inca rotational systems of reciprocal exchange in terms of, of Ley de la Hermandad or Law of Brotherhood. Uh, the following passage from the Comentarios Reales explains how indigenous peoples helped each other by farming, uh, in farming by quoting Blas Valera's explanation of the Ley de la Hermandad. What they called law of brotherhood was that which obliged the inhabitants of every village to assist one another in plowing, sowing, bringing in, harvest, in the harvest, building their houses and such things without any payment whatsoever. They, they called the law of Michanakawi, changing by turns or by families, established that all operations carried out in common the same rules as govern the distribution and use of land should be applied so that every province, village, family, and person would perform their due means of work and no more, and that the work should be parceled out so, so that everyone did uh, his spell by following a spell of leisure." End of quote. This passage is one of many moments where Garcilaso insists on highlighting the administrative capacities and the extremely just and fair and extremely fair Inca state. In Garcilaso's appropriation of La Palera, he emphasizes the absence of the use of money in the process of exchange between communities and the state. Basically, Garcilaso is arguing that the, that the law of brotherhood is more effective than money as a means of payment. Moreover, the exchange between a state and communities took the form of communal work that was distributed equally. Garcilaso is relying here on an explicit opposition between reciprocal mode of exchange and commodity exchange, one anchored in the power of the gift as different from the power of money. Seeing the text from the perspective of modes of exchange, the first thing to remark is that the Inca state deplored the logic of gift counter gift ideology to exchange benefits for the surplus produced with self, within self-sufficient communities. If we take into consideration that the power of the gift that regulates relations between the Inca state and their communities holding inequalities and disinterest in, in check, then Garcilaso's text and Mora's thesis become clear. The Inca state appropriated pre-existing mechanisms used by local communities to prevent the emergence of antagonism, capturing the logic of the gift counter gift ideology tra and transforming it into a state-centered economy. A brief, ex of exam a brief examination of Garcilaso's conception of the use of reciprocal exchange of, gi of gifts by the Incas can help understand how the Incas use reciprocity as a way of taming antagonism.
And so the victorious and vanquished warriors should be reconciled and live together in permanent peace and concord, and, and that any hatred and rancor that have been generated in the course of the war should be buried and forgotten. They order great banquets to be held with abundant supply of good things to which the blind, the lame, the dumb, the, and other disabled, pe disabled people were invited to share in royal liberality. At this feast, there were dances by maidens, games and celebrations of boys, and military exercises by grown men. In addition to this, they were given many presents of gold, silver, and feathers to enrich their, their dresses and serve as decorations for their principal feasts, and other awards consistent of garments and similar prices, which they greatly esteemed, were distributed. The Incas bestowed this and similar gifts on newly conquered Indians, so that whatever brutish and barbarous they had been, they were subdued by affection and attached to the service by bonds so strong that no province ever dreamed of rebelling." End of quote. It is necessary to clarify that Strictly speaking, the reciprocity Garcilaso evokes here is not one internal to the community, pooling of resources practiced by hunter gatherers or clan societies, but the form of reciprocity between communities that paves the way for a supra-rational state. state sorry. Uh, these communities are divided between the conquered and imperial conqueror, meaning that the kind of reciprocity described by, by Garcilaso takes place one takes place after one community plunders another. The appeal to gifts employ the pre uh, existing reciprocal practices for the conquered and the conquerors to reconcile with one another and to quell animosity between them. Mode of exchange B takes the form of, I quote, conquering, I quote Karatani here, conquering side offering protection and the vanquished in return for their subservience, as well as redistribution in return for the offered tribute. What happens, Karatani concludes, is that the reality of the conquest is disavowed by both parties and the feeling of sharing mutual past becomes possible also. At this point, the gift that is returned for the sake of continuing the, the plunder of the community is no longer purely reciprocal. The victor, the ruler in this case, plunders the vanquished, but this is not simple, a simple matter of pillaging which would not lead to the rise of the state. This only happens when the exchange occurs between the ruler and the vanquished who offer their spoils in, in, of war in the form of taxes or tribute. Consequently, the ruler comes to think of this forced labor or tribute not as something taken from them by force, but rather as counter gifts or obligations offered in return of gifts granted by the ruler. Garcilaso points out that the Incas showered the vanquished with gifts and banquets in order to dispel their anger and rancor. As a result, this gift become a way of securing their subjects' love and service and thus guaranteeing Inca hegemony. When explaining the importance of irrigation, Murat quotes Carl with Fogel, the inventor of the famous hydraulic hypothesis according to which hydraulic empires exercise bureaucratic control over people by controlling and monopolizing the flow of water through large-scale irrigation projects. Although there is a strong link between with Fogel's hydraulic hypothesis and Mura's vertical ecological archipelago, Mura limits himself to quoting with Fogel without developing the centrality of water in his own argument. Basically, Mura's insistence on the transference of the relations of reciprocity to the relations between the Incas and the vanquished communities leads him to distrust the totalizing vision of the Incas in terms of oriental despotism. And yet, Although water occupies a central position in the Inca model of exchange and domination, one that subordinated the reci reciprocal to tributary strain, ex ex exchange. For Mura, the construction of the famous Inca and Dennis was an essential feature that changed the scale and scope of the Inca system of rotational sharing because their construction demanded more planning and centralization. Garcilaso describes the Inca irrigation system as a part of an overall strategy of augmenting lands and redistributing them to their own vassals. I quote, When the Incas had conquered any kind of kingdom or province and established the form of government in its towns and the way of life of their inhabitants in accordance with their idolatrous religion and laws, 
He ordered that the agricultural land should be extended. This implies, of course, the area under, the area under maize. For this purpose, irrigation engineers were brought. Some of these were extremely skilled, and this clearly demonstrated their works, of which some survive today, and others have been destroyed, leaving only traces behind. These engineers made the necessary irrigation channels according to the amount of land that could be turned to account the greater part of Peru is pouring grain bearing and land and the Incas therefore tried as far as possible to extend what was what was there possible. Once the Inca conquered the province and redistributed its people, they ordered an increase in production of corn by bringing in their famous engineers. Garcilaso's text allows us to understand the Incas and Denes in terms of an experiment in environment making that surpassed the ecological limits of the region. Because the country falls within the torrid zone, irrigation is necessary and great attention was paid to this. Not a grain of maize was sown and less channel water was available. They also dug channels to water their pastures when the autumn rains were delayed and they had an infinite quantity of flocks that had to give their pasture the same attention as the rainlands. The channels for the pastures were destroyed when the Spanish entered Peru, but traces of them are still found. Garcilaso emphasizes how the, how the harsh weather of what Aristotle called the torrid zone, which was supposed to be uninhabitable, demanded uh, irrigation systems, and there were no maize without irrigation. Particularly relevant for our purposes is how Garcilaso shifts perspectives between describing the biosphere's material conditions and noting that the, empl the employment of human artifacts to rechannel water, thus transforming that water into an, uh, an agricultural device. This shift of perspective between natural and human spheres parallels the shift between Andean and the Spanish cultures since Garcilaso's praise of the Incas' engineering capacities was meant to present the Incas as equal to the Romans who were known for their hydraulic prowesses. Human-human relations of exchange and dominations are intertwined with human-non-human exchange as environment-making metabolism. Garcilaso provides more information about how the irrigation system worked within the Inca system, sorry, within the Inca system of exchange between community and the state. The terraces were usually assigned to the sun and the Incas, since the latter had been responsible for reconstructing them. In addition to the irrigated maize fields, other lands without supply of water was divided between them for dry farming and some with crops of great importance, such as three called papa, oca, and anus. This land was also divided due to the proportions of sun and the income and a third part for their subjects, but as it were, as it was waterless and low productivity, this sun only for a year or two and then rested while another part was sown. And this way, the poor soil was kept under control, and there was always an abundance for its use, of its use. This passage is a perfect example of the thesis of complementary exploitation of different ecological zones advanced by Murra. Returning to the thread of Murra's argument, the construction of this extremely successful Andenes was itself part of the exchange between community and the state, where communities relied on the state for the construction of irrigation ditches. As it becomes evident in the analysis of Inca Garcilaso, the environment-making qualities of the Andenes are a result of the mandate to construct them by a state that appropriates time-based rotational system of communal work proper to the reciprocal mode of exchange. This passage is consistent with Mora's first thesis about the vertical or ecological archipelago, according to which Andean people maximize the control of different environments to produce different crops. If a parcel of land did not produce maize due to lack of irrigation, then the Incas employed a rotational method to produce other goods such as potatoes. When a plot of land was infertile due to the lack of irrigation, the Incas sowed a single crop for only one or two years before rotating the crops again so the first ones would rest or lay fallow. 
the environmental and economic dimensions of this rotational system are intertwined in a broad machinery in which the Incas practice a simultaneous exploitation of complementary ecological zones or niches, overcoming the limitations of the Andean, the Andean landscape and the unforeseeable character of events such as droughts. Irrigation was a technology for dominating nature that was central, not secondary, to the vertical uh, ecological archipelago. I think this is the, the last quotation. El Inca Garcilaso de la Vega refers to the distribution of water according to the law of brotherhood in the following passage. In districts where the quantity of water for irrigation was small, they divided it proportionately as they did with everything else they shared so that they should not dispute, so that there should be no dispute among the Indians about obtaining it. This was only done for years of scanty rainfall when the need was greatest. The water was measured and as it was known from experience how long it took to irrigate the fanega of land, each India was accordingly granted the, no the number of hours supply he needed the amount of land he had with plenty to spare. Water was taken by turns according to the order of plots of lands one after another. No preferences was given to the rich or the nobles to favor to relatives of the curaca or to the curacas themselves or the real officials or, or governors. Anyone who neglected to irrigate his land at the proper time received an ignominious punishment. The, he was struck on the back with a stone three or four times in public or his arms and legs were whipped with osier switches. This was a penalty for idleness or slackness, which they consider a serious, a very serious fault. When water was scarce, the Incas gave it like a gift, considering their own order to avoid conflicts between peoples. In some, the role of the state was to tame social antagonism by redistributing water. Water was redistributed using turns in a rotational system. More, most importantly, everybody had a right to water regardless of, their, of, of her social condition. Moreover, the state severely punished those who did not take good care of their land or failed to irrigate. In this text, we can observe how the Inca redistributed the goods in a way that it was consistent with Garcilaso's laws of the uh, law of brotherhood. In other words, water was also an object of redistribution within the Inca policies and the overall structure of the vertical archipelago. Consequently, water was an object of exchange that was organized according to a system of rotational sharing. Reading this text through the lenses of eco-perspectivism, we can see that because water is fundamental for sustaining life, its control gives place to forms of power that are, that are simultaneous power over nature and power over people, forms of geopower and forms of biopolitical power. Although we don't have time to develop this idea here, it is significant to note three points. First, Carl Fogel uh, quotes these passages as an example of the total control, these passages of the Inca Silas Red, uh, as an example of total control exerted by the Inca Empire over their subjects, thus fueling the hydraulic hypothesis according to which the, man the management of water was inseparable from the uh, total state control. Second, the Viceroy Francisco de Toledo, responsible for structuring the Andean landscape within with the purpose of imposing mercantile economy in Peru, also implemented the same principle in his ordenanzas, which are laws for the distribution of use and conservation of water, a legal corpus composed of 15 uh, laws that would then later be uh, recopulated into formal treatises before becoming the most influence, influ, influence, influ, influential source of water management in South America. This is an example of how the colonial state captured reciprocity, putting it, putting it to work for a mercantile economy or model of exchange C. Nevertheless, the long-term memory of the reciprocal redistribution of water also empowered resistance against both the state and model of exchange C. Let me illustrate this with an example. In the 18th century, Bishop Moscoso wrote a letter to Areche denouncing the 1781 rebellion led by Tupac Amaru, who opposed the Mita, 
at the system of tributary labor in the mines and the Repartimento de Mercancias, which is a system of forced distribution of merchandise to the natives, in his letters, where he urged the authorities to extirpate the Andean past, Moscoso blamed the royal commentaries of the Incaro Silaso. I quote, if the commentaries had not been uh, the reading and instruction of the insurgent Jose Gabriel Tupac Amaru, if this and other readings of certain authors of this kingdom had not been accepted by the traitor in all they said about the conquest, Tupac Amaru would not have been embarked in this detest detestable audacity of this rebellion. End of quote. Also, the 2000 water wars in Cochabamba, Bolivia, and other contemporary struggles for water in, in the Andes invoke this system of rotational sharing against the commodification and privatization of water. The coordinator in defense of water and life in Bolivia appealed to the combined idea of ancient practices of suyus and mitas, which are this, exactly these rotational systems of water distribution described by Garcilaso, and the, as, as well as the idea of water as life and irreducible to commodification. This is an example of what Caratani calls a mode of exchange D, the return of mode of exchange A in a higher dimension, that of simultaneous affirmation of freedom and equality that appears under the unreciprocated gift of water. The bolivalent, the, bolivalent, the bolivalent character of this water and the role in multiple modes of exchange is consistent with ambiguity and complexity of the so-called Inca reciprocity. These traces of the reciprocal mode of exchange within the tributary mode of exchange contains a revolutionary potential capable of resisting the commodification of water. Maybe Garcilaso's text can be considered as a hydrological cycle by itself, a double-headed serpent, an irrigation system that both connects and divides different kinds of water, neoplatonic beliefs and Andean beliefs, flaws of reciprocity in nature, and flaws of nature in reciprocity. <coughs> Just as in this idea and the another hydrological cycle, these flows all have the same origin and end because, as Garcilaso liked to say, there is only one world. Thank you very much.